The following program is brought to you in part by the film Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace. Welcome to another Leon China Report. We have a really eclectic and exciting show tonight. El Dadbeck. I'm a uh, journalist um, working mainly for the Israeli newspaper Yediot Achonot, which is one of the biggest dailies in Israel. And I have uh, mainly been Berlin-based correspondent uh, of this newspaper for the last uh, 14 years. But I've also been working quite a lot on the Middle East, having visited many Middle Eastern countries and reporting from there. My book, uh, Germany at Odds, is trying to um, show Germany as I have experienced it uh, in the last uh, 13, 14 years that I've been there, through the uh, personal and, and uh, professional experiences that I had there, and uh, which brought me actually to uh, see a Germany very different from what people used to think about Germany. I mean, there are so many cliches about Germany, starting from the fact that the Germans are very uh, punctual, that they are very uh, uh, technical, that they have no sense of humor, and going up to, uh, like, um, they are one of the strongest democracies in Europe, and they have confronted uh, their past in a very, uh, even a courageous way. And uh, having been there for a long time, I have discovered that many of the ideas that we have about Germany are false. And this is exactly what I'm describing in my book. I think that uh, as an Israeli, um, the, uh, the biggest discovery for me was that actually um, most of the Germans, large sections of the German society, didn't really deal with their past. Um, we are brought up with the idea that uh, there is a new Germany, there is another Germany, uh, which is completely different from uh, the Germany that existed uh, during Second World War, and that they, uh, the Germans have completely uh, sort of uh, distanced themselves from uh, what uh, they did in the past. However, when you start looking into the details, and one says that the devil lies in the details, devils is a very uh, important expression in this uh, uh, matter, you do find out that, um, let's take the issue, for example, of um, anti-Semitism. You would expect from a nation that had such a uh, negative past to know exactly what's anti-Semitism and to do everything so that anti-Semitism would not exist anymore, not only within the German society, but within the European society and within other societies, like the Middle Eastern one. However, you find out that the issue of anti-Semitism is not at all being taught at school at schools, at the school system in Germany. Um, people have a very vague idea what's anti-Semitism. For most of the Germans, anti-Semitism is six million dead Jews gassed in Auschwitz and other death camps. They do not think about the fact that in order to get to six million Jews murdered in Auschwitz and other places, there was a whole process which took place. Now, because anti-Semitism can only be six million dead Jews, and we do not have today six million dead Jews, all the anti-Semitic events that are taking place in Germany and elsewhere, may it be in France, in Belgium, in Egypt, or in uh, Israel, are not considered to be anti-Semitic, because it's not six million dead Jews. So you have here a failure of the German education system, which is really very 
grave. On the other hand, uh, you ask yourself, have or do the young generations in Germany learn enough about their past in order to work out a better future? You find out two very interesting things. First of all, the issue of learning about the Holocaust is not complementary in all German schools, all over Germany. And uh, since the education system in Germany is a federal one, each state, each school have their own uh, pedagogic uh, system and program. And therefore you have, at the end of the day, quite a lot of people who get out of school and haven't really dealt with the issue of Holocaust. So they are lacking knowledge about the past of their country. Secondly, very few Germans, I'm talking about the young Germans, learn about what made it possible that Germany became Nazi and did what it did. Um, and therefore, since people do not deal with the roots of the phenomenon, of the historical phenomenon, you get more and more the impression that actually what happened in Germany between 34 and 45, sorry, 33 and 45, was something that doesn't really have to, be, to do with the uh, German uh, history. Something that was like in parentheses, something out of the German history, there was a foreign invasion, probably from Austria. People came from outer space, took over Germany, and did what you hear every now and then from German politicians, crimes in the name of the Germans. As if the name of the Germans was stolen from them, somebody used it to do something illegal, and then on the 8th, 9th of May, 1945, those criminals disappeared completely from the world, came back to Mars or where, wherever they came from, and the Germans took over again their name, and now they have to deal with crimes which they were not really responsible for. So you have a whole situation in which the historical debate in Germany, on one side you have very courageous persons, and also among the young Germans, that are dealing very bravely with what happened um, 70 and 80 years ago. However, the majority of the society is tending to rewrite history in a way which is much more convenient uh, to deal with and which actually says that um, the Germans are not really responsible for what happened. I believe that the issue of lack of responsibility or putting the responsibility on the shoulders of somebody else is very typical to, um, to all the European nations, actually. Uh, and by the way, not only with regards to the Holocaust, but mainly on the issue of the Holocaust. Um, what I'm saying now uh, is not going to clean the Germans from their part of responsibility for organizing and managing the uh, industrial execution uh, of uh, six million Jews. However, one should not forget, and one tends to forget, that the Germans enjoyed very vivid cooperation from all the European nations. Not only from the Austrians, but from the French, from the Brits, from uh, the Poles, even to a certain extent from uh, the uh, Scandinavian nations, um, in some southern countries of uh, of, uh, of Europe. I believe that the um, cases in which nations did something to stop or not to cooperate with the Nazis can be counted on two fingers. You have the case of Denmark and you have the case of Bulgaria. That's all. And when you think that um, Europe has more than 30 countries um, oh, and there's obviously the case of Albania. Albania, the only country where at the end of the war there were more Jews than at the beginning of the war. Uh, this is very important because Albania is Muslim. And although the Albanians cooperated with the Nazis and the SS, they did, many of them, save Jews. So we have three cases, the cases of Denmark, of Bulgaria, and of uh, Albania. 
Um, the Europeans are very happy to throw all the guilt on the shoulders of the Germans, while as the Germans are doing all the best to say, guys, um, it was somebody else, it was nurse. Um, you have, of course, some very brave persons in Germany who take full responsibility for what the Germans have done. And I want to mention in this context, um, Chancellor Angela Merkel, you do remember that um, there was recently a debate about the role of the Mufti of Jerusalem uh, during the Holocaust. And the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu actually uh, accused the Mufti of pushing Hitler into uh, exterminating the Jews. Angela Merkel, standing side by side with Benjamin Netanyahu, said very bravely, the responsibility for the Holocaust is a German responsibility and we acknowledge it and take it. However, Angela Merkel is unfortunately not very typical of the common spirit in the German society. More and more Germans today, especially the young generations, are saying, guys, 70 years after the end of Second World War, we do not want to hear about it anymore. And by the way, this is an attitude which existed in Germany already in 1945. It's not something new. It's this continuous wish not really to take responsibility for the crimes done by the Germans. I, I decided to call my book uh, Germany at Odds because I do believe that not having dealt seriously and deeply with the roots of the problems that enable Germany to become Nazi um, and doing very artificial things after the end of the Second World War in order to satisfy the so-called occupying powers um, may cause Germany many problems in the uh, future and I believe that we can already see that with the arrival of so many refugees and immigrants to Germany, um, the German public is reacting to certain things in a way that shows that uh, not deep enough work was done in order to deal with the demons of the past. There are many reasons to the fact that uh, most of the German uh, society doesn't want to deal with uh, the responsibility uh, it has to uh, the past. And I insist on the fact that most, because there are, as I have mentioned in uh, the last minutes, people, courageous people who do take responsibility for it. But um, first of all, I think it's much easier to say that it didn't really happen. Um, that actually others were responsible for it. And um, I somehow I have the feeling that there are in the German society too many people who either do not see any wrong with what happened or to a certain extent believe what was then the Nazi propaganda, that what happened was a punishment for what the Jews have done. And nowadays, because for many years it was thought as politically incorrect to express such uh, opinions, what you see in Germany and other European countries is the projection of the thoughts about the Jews being the cause of evil of all evil in the world on Israel. And um, this explains why many Germans and many Europeans have absolutely no understanding for the very complex situation in which Israel lives and to the very difficult challenges that Israel has to face. And what they are saying is that actually, and you see it in different polls that are being published in recent years, there is a growing number of Germans who actually say that the Israelis are the new Nazis. 
So it's a um, an interesting psychological phenomenon because on one side you have the Germans saying, oh, well, the Nazis didn't really do what people say that they did, or the Nazis um, were not us. But at the same time, you would have like 41% of the Germans saying that actually what Israel is doing to the Palestinians is exactly what uh, the Nazis did to the Jews. And you ask yourself, how come in a country that tells everybody that it has confronted it pa its past, learned lessons from its past, how can it be that such a uh, society comes up with uh, such unbelievable comparisons. Because there is absolutely no comparison between what the Nazis did to the Jews and what the Israelis are doing uh, to the Palestinians. Um, and this throwing away of responsibility or projecting responsibility of the past to the Israelis of today is part of this um, neurotic connection that the Germans uh, entertain with their past. The popularity of the BDS movement in Europe is connected without any doubts to the uh, um, anti-Semitic culture that still exists in most of the European countries. Um, the whole idea of the BDS that there shouldn't be a Jewish state is according to the working definition of the EU on anti-Semitism, an anti-Semitic idea. And you see that actually more and more events where the BDS are taking place are becoming uh, anti-Semitic. Uh, I have the absolute conviction that uh, the popularity of the BDS movement in Europe, and by the way in the States, is uh, based on anti-Semitic uh, feelings. I think that uh, the whole debate about uh, the possibility that Mein Kampf would be now uh, published again in Germany is very typical to the way the Germans are inventing debates that uh, are out of proportions. Why? You get the impression through this debate that Mein Kampf didn't exist in Germany ever since the war ended, which is a false impression. In many homes, and I've seen it in private homes, you have copies of the book which was sold at the time uh, in more than two million copies. It was not that after when the, when the Second World War ended, people were burning this book in the streets. People were keeping it, partly because most of the Germans at the time saw uh, the 8th and the 9th of May 1945 not as a day of liberation, but a day of defeat. And this idea is still existing. So the book is in houses, the book is in libraries, the book is in universities, you go to flea markets, you can buy copies of the original book in, in German. So it's not that the book didn't exist. What we are talking now is about the fact that in Germany there would be a possibility to print the book again. In times where you can actually download this book on internet anytime. So the book is there. What is being done uh, by the uh, Munich in, uh, Institute for uh, German History is that they try to give an analytic approach to Mein Kampf, which means that they take the original text and they put comments on it in order to show people where Hitler lied, where he uh, invented himself uh, a new biography, uh, where he uh, was using sources as academic, academical sources and uh, were not really academic, and where he was saying the truth. Um, 
There are some opinions in Germany that the work which was done by the Institute is not a very serious one. Um, however, if you are to deal with this book, and I think that you cannot hide it anymore, uh, at a certain point you really have to give people the tools to deal with the um, very problematic content of this book. I myself have a problem with um, commenting this book because it seems to me that you give it a holiness which it doesn't deserve because, I mean, coming from the Ju Judaism, from Judaism and uh, Jewish uh, culture, you take the, you take the holy uh, books and you comment on them. So, um, taking Hitler's Mein Kampf, which is really a book not worth of reading, I believe, and commenting it gives it um, an importance which it shouldn't have. However, since we live in a time where access to this document is really all over the place, I think that giving people the um, adequate tools to understand the falsity of Hitler's uh, ideology and the, uh, the danger in the ideology is, uh, is very important. And by the way, what is important to say, Mein Kampf was published and published and published in other languages ever since the end of the war, which means in English. It was tra translated into Arabic, into Turkish, into Farsi. You have it all over the world because nobody was actually doing anything to stop it. So if you really want to read this trash, there's nothing that uh, will stop you from uh, finding it. Uh, you just have to find the civilized world, has to find a way to give people tools to understand uh, the falsity of this uh, book. The story of the meeting that I had with uh, the son of the commander of Auschwitz, Rudolf Hoess, is one of the, um, I believe, most difficult um, uh, chapters of uh, my book. And the person who translated it into English also said to me at the time that uh, she was so emotionally involved with the story that comes up in this chapter and that she really had difficulties in, in, in putting it uh, into English emotionally, not uh, linguistically. Um, some six years ago I get uh, the information that the uh, grandson of hers contacted um, Yad Vashem with the very bizarre offer to sell Yad Vashem personal objects that belonged to his grandfather, the mass murderer. And um, I contacted him in order to, to see if he understood how sick this was, trying to make money from these objects. And um, during the talk that we had on the phone, he told me all sorts of stories and uh, he said that actually it was his family that insisted on selling it. Um, and then I asked him, listen, why don't we meet and you'll show me what you have and uh, let's see. And uh, I was hoping that I would be able to convince him to give those things to Yad Vashem. Uh, you know, uh, it, at the time I thought that it would have um, the historical importance that might um, help Yad Vashem to show um, the terrible aspect of a German family living just 20 meters away from the first gas chamber in Auschwitz, seeing from its garden the chimney of the first crematorium, and having the most normal and happy life that you can think of. I thought it was very important that Yad Vashem would have this uh, uh, documentation. And we met, he showed me what he had. Uh, it was mostly uh, pictures of uh, the happy life the family had in the villa, 
Hurst, uh, just 20 meters away from uh, Auschwitz, from the first camp. Um, and then during the long discussion that we had, he told me all sorts of things, which I didn't know if I could uh, take as true or not true. But he then told me that because of his name, he never was in Auschwitz. And I was very much astonished. Um, I asked him, I mean, with such a name, if anybody should be in Auschwitz, you are the first one to be there. And then he came up with some excuses which, completely, which were completely strange. And then I told him, listen, um, you know, my Austrian family was also murdered by, uh, uh, by the Nazis. At the time, I thought that it was in Auschwitz because according to the, uh, the documents that I had, it showed that it was uh, in Auschwitz. I said, I'm a third generation of the victims. You're a third generation of the uh, criminals. Um, let's go together. And it was a test. And uh, he agreed. And we went together for the first time to Auschwitz in November 2009. And it was a very strange experience because um, I constantly had the feeling that he was actually going there on a uh, real estate tour, which means that the, the thing that interested him the most was to see the villa of his grandfather. Later on, I learned also from him and from other persons that were in contact with him, that he considered that really to be uh, a possession of the family, and he wanted it back so that he would be able to open a museum about, and I quote him, uh, Rudolf Hess, the man. And, um, well, I, I won't go into the details, I s tell everything in, in the book, but it was a very, um, it was a very hard experience to be there with him. Um, I kept on asking myself, how would I react if I would be in his shoes? And this is why for a too long period, I uh, allowed him to manipulate me into telling me all sorts of stories and trying to use me for his um, own needs. Um, however, um, at the end, I decided to um, cut all ties with him because from what I saw, from what I heard, and I was not the only one who got this impression, this person is mainly interested in using the very problematic story of his family in order to get money and fame. He has a very problematic past himself, which he hides. Um, and uh, there were many persons who trusted him and regret it now terribly. He actually uh, decided not to uh, um, not to give this uh, to Yad Vashem because he still wanted to do some business with it. He donated it to the same uh, historical institute that published now uh, Mein Kampf uh, in Munich um, with very strict conditions, which means that it's not something that is open to everybody to see. And by the way, the historical importance of this object is very limited. Uh, you don't really get to see anything important except for the aspect of the very good life of the family Hess in Auschwitz. Um, but if you want to consult these objects, uh, you have to get the approval of Hess himself. And this opens, obviously, um, the way to certain deals. I, I, I came to Berlin as an Israeli, not as a Jew, and on a personal level, I still see myself as an Israeli, and um, most of the things that I describe in my book have to do with the sight of an Israeli on the German society. And one must understand that um, 
um, there is a huge difference between being a Jew in Israel and being a Jew in Europe or in uh, uh, in Germany. I mean, um, I as an Israeli uh, growing up in in uh, a Jew growing up in Israel, I. I learned obviously about anti-Semitism, but I thought it was gone from the world. And then I went to Europe, I've been there on mission in, in France, in Austria, now in Germany, and um, and I learned on you know on a personal personal level what's anti-Semitism and that anti-Semitism is still is still there. And that as an Israeli you get actually a double portion of anti-Semitism, being a Jew and being Israeli. Um, so there is a huge difference uh, between being in Israel, living as a major majority, and not knowing what does it mean to be a Jew as a minority elsewhere. In Berlin, it's difficult because you have quite a lot of expectations from Germany. I came with many expectations, maybe too many expectations, having thought that um, the past obliges Germany to have a much more understanding uh, position toward Israel and uh, toward the Jews. And uh, having discovered that this was not the case uh, in many uh, in many aspects and in parts of the uh, German society, um, I must say that um, I was um, I was very much disappointed. I was very much disappointed. However. Um, I still uh, consider it to be a challenge uh, to see what's happening in Germany because uh, Germany is becoming more and more important in Europe, um, on the international arena. Uh, there is the demand from Germany to take a leading role and it's uh, going to be extremely interesting to see how a society that hasn't really coped with the dem demons of the past uh, is going to take command of international um, affairs. There is no doubt about the fact that the demons of the past are uh, resurging again uh, with the massive arrival of uh, refugees and immigrants, illegal immigrants or legal immigrants, whatever you uh, might call them. Uh, the numbers are so uh, uh, immense that it, it actually changes the the human landscape in many of the uh, the big cities of uh, Germany. Um, we have seen that um, with the attacks on women uh, in recent weeks, those people coming to Germany are not only refugees fleeing from terror and hunger and war in countries like Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Um, you have quite a lot of people who um, misused this tragic human situation in order to try and uh, get into Europe. And um, having in mind the false idea that first of all Europe needs them I think that here Europe made a huge pr uh, mistake by declaring that because of the uh, negative demographic development in Europe, um, Europe needs immigration so that there would be enough young people that would hold the elderly generations in Europe. Um, you just, through this position, you gave certain elements of those immigrants the idea that actually they were coming to Europe not to find bread, but to breed. And this is why we had this unbelievable situation of sexual harassment and sexual attacks and rapes of um, German women, by the way, not only Christian women, also Muslim uh, women, uh, during uh, recent weeks. On the other uh, hand, you have many who do believe that they um, can come to Germany or to Europe and get social benefits and uh, live much better than wherever they are coming from. Um, it's not I like the situation in the States where you have to prove that you have certain advantage in profit of the society in which you want to integrate. The European 
immigration policy has been for years, allowing people to come and to live at the expenses of the state and not doing enough in order to force those people to integrate in the local culture brings to the disastrous uh, results that we already see in many European countries through violence, terror, and um, you know, you have places in, in Europe where they have Sharia police, uh, something that um, has absolutely nothing to do with European values and European ideas. And the authorities just stand there incapable of doing anything because, you know, either they believe in some false freedom of expression uh, or they are just too afraid to do anything because they are um, fearing the uh, aggressive reaction of the immigrants. In the last 10 years, the uh, Jewish population of Berlin has become uh, very colorful. I mean, uh, first of all, at the beginning of the 90s, you had all the uh, people coming from the uh, former Soviet countries, and they have been a very strong enrichment to the Jewish community, which had great difficulties in integrating them because you had like 30,000 Jews, which had all of the sudden uh, to integrate 80 to 90,000 Jews coming. So you didn't have enough institutions, you didn't have enough rabbis, you didn't have, you know, the structure to get all these people. Um, so you have these Russians, which now are more and more um, integrated into the communities and into the um, German life. You have American Jews coming to uh, live in Berlin. You have Israelis coming to live in Berlin. You have, strangely enough, uh, Jews from European countries where the extreme right is uh, galloping, like Hungary, Greece, France, uh, who are fleeing those countries and coming to sit in Berlin because they want, they feel much more comfortable in a European uh, country and European culture, do not have the, um, the courage to go to other places like the States, Israel or Australia. So um, it's very colorful. However, you don't uh, see it in matter of numbers of people registrating to the Jewish community of Berlin because unfortunately the Jewish community of Berlin is completely um, um, inactive. You have um, groups of people with certain interests that uh, took over the community and actually the community stopped from being um, any important element of the uh, life in Berlin in the last two or three years. It's actually non-existent. There are some uh, attempts to revive it now, but it's going to be a very long process. Peace means taking into account the dignity of other people and the fact that there are other people who have certain rights. Thank you, Aviva, for coming here. Thank you for uh, having me. It was really nice to have you here and have this amazing drum session with you. Uh, first of all, how did you come up with the idea of having a drum cafe and playing the drums? So it wasn't my idea. It was started by a man called Warren Lieberman mm -hmm. in South Africa um, in about 1996-97 when uh, the end of apartheid and they were bringing the disenfranchised communities into the business sector and uh, actually he had a, a love for drums and every Wednesday people would come to his house and drum and, and after a while there were like 200 people coming to his house to drum and so he moved it and created a little place called the Drum Cafe.
mm. and that's why it's called Drum Cafe because there was a drum cafe where people would come and meet together and play drums and then after uh, Nelson Mandela became the president he created this method of interactive drumming for the corporate community whereby we would go in and uh, unite the cultures and prepare them for training and it became so successful in South Africa that it then soon spread around the world and now we have 30 offices around the world. Wow. So in, in your opinion do you think that this playing drums together can help to resolve conflicts and um, go more towards peace? Well we hope so and that's why we've brought it to Israel because we realize that what we have is a vehicle for unity. The interactive drumming program that's what it does. It brings people together. It creates a focused, receptive group of people who feel good about themselves and about each other. And um, so we figured that if we bring it to Israel, we can begin to uh, bring people together through a different modality, not through speaking so much, but through playing drums, creating an environment where where only collaboration can thrive, creating a culture of collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, are you working also internationally in other countries? Uh, I have the drum cafe in America, in New York. That's where I began 12 years ago. We started the drum cafe there and really mostly what we work on there is um, diversity and inclusion, which is, you know, it's a, it's a big issue and around the world in the corporate community and really in the communities at large and so the Charney Center for example Leon Charney is all about negotiation he's all about finding uh, conflict resolution tactics and so our philosophies are very much aligned there and also coming from South Africa and uh, Nelson Mandela uh, he talked about the philosophy of Ubuntu now Ubuntu means I am who I am through others. A person with Ubuntu is open and available to others, does not feel threatened by the fact that someone else may be um, more senior than them or better at something. Each person has their own integral role to play within the community and, and each person brings to the whole I am who I am through you. So. Um, Nelson Mandela brought this philosophy of Ubuntu really to South Africa and to the transformation in South Africa from conflict to mm. resolution and it was a very peaceful transformation one of the only ones in that you know in the history of the world we have had a peaceful trans transformation from conflict to resolution mm -hmm. and um, and that's what he believed in. He believed, like Leon Charney, in negotiation rather than violence. He believed in negotiation leading to conflict resolution. And that's what we were doing here today. We were essentially negotiating around the main vision, around a bass beat, negotiating with conflicting, opposing rhythms, how we can bring them together, lock them into phase to create something greater than and different from and more beautiful than the sum of each part. Mm -hmm. Is this, would you say, this session, this drum session, is meant for people who are already more open-minded towards peace or for people who you want to evoke this in them? You want to evoke the feelings, like you said, of um, renewing energy and like open-mindedness. Would you say the audience is meant that? This interactive drumming experience is for everybody and anybody. From, you know, we do it with groups of 10 people to 10,000 people. Uh, nobody needs to have any experience and you don't need to come with any pre-existing story. Uh, all we do is very simple. We make people feel connected and we make them feel like they want to collaborate with each other. We make them feel like they, um, they, they feel inspired, uplifted, inspired to do something and that's up to them what they do, whether they're five years old or 95 years old. You know, we've done it for um, 
corporations where, where they've come together, two corporations merging and they're very suspicious of each other. All the top executives, they pushed them into the room, shut the doors because they were very nervous, not like you guys who are <laughs> happy to, to play and they pushed them into the room. They're all very nervous. They sat down within minutes. As you can see, we have people drumming together in complete unison. And from that point on, they, you know, they walk into a room, pick up a drum, do something they've never done before, really. Mm -hmm. And within minutes, as a, as a group, the risk has paid off. Mm -hmm. And so what you have there is a group who are no longer risk averse, who are feeling connected. I am who I am through you. That's the whole philosophy of Ubuntu there, practically. I'm drumming on rhythm because you're drumming on rhythm and we're doing it together. So, you know, it's uh, so much at the Chinese Center is about conflict resolution. And thanks to the Chinese Center, please, for having this event. <laughs> The analogies uh, between that and, and, a, and a band, uh, a bands of musicians, especially rhythms, we can take two opposing and often conflicting rhythms, and if they come together around the main beat, the same bass beat, or uh, we like to say the same vision, the same mission, then uh, then together they can lock into phase, and and then they're no longer conflicting and opposing because they've created something that's, that's different. How did this uh, workshop, the drumming workshop, make you feel in comparison to how you felt before? Well, for me, all of it was a peak because it was always very energetic and very noisy. But I think the peak was the last part, the part where they started singing and we kind of like moved on with them. We kind of made a few sounds when they were doing it, however, we also participated in our own way, even though we didn't have a coordinated rhythm, we were all just banging on the drum and feeling, even though it should have been noisy, it still was a harmony, it still was some sort of unity between us. And I think the, the most interesting part was uh, the rumble at the end, where we all just beat really, really fast and then we're like, yes! The feeling of achievement was, was absolutely amazing and we were all so happy.